the more ways that the tools help me be more productive to get working on that clever stuff that I'm thinking of to get it down. Devbox setup, the solution load time, how long does it take to create a new project? How long does it take to iterate? What does it look like to actually deploy it? Where does the developer have to spend energy? And how can we actually reduce the amount of energy that the developer has to spend? Hi, I'm Richard Campbell from .NET Rocks and Run Ends Radio. I'm here on the Microsoft campus building 122, and then we're doing this Visual Studio mini series, and I'm wrapping up the series with my friend Amanda Silver. Great to see you. Who's been around .NET the whole time. For the first version of Studio Studio .NET, you know, there was a couple of studios before that, the consolidated UI, that whole view on things. Yeah, I mean, my, my career at Microsoft has basically spanned the existence of .NET itself in yeah. some ways. I started in 2001. You know, I think we were very close to releasing the first version of .NET yeah. in that close. era. February of 2002. <laughs> you're, you're the calendar man. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> but yeah, it's just been an amazing journey to see how everything has evolved and how the industry has evolved, how yeah. programming has evolved. Just so much has happened in the last 22 years. And you know, one of the things that's come out of this series just been like being unabashedly enthusiastic about being in an IDE. Yeah. That that space is a great place to work, that everything you need is there, you're never switching around much. But the landscape for a developer has gotten so much bigger. That's definitely true. I mean, when I first started using Visual mm -hmm. Studio, that was actually after I graduated from college. I was, wow. I was an Emacs user and yeah. a Unix developer. So and you were used to an editor. <laughs> I was used to a, an editor, but we didn't even have IntelliSense yeah. at the time. And so coming into Visual Studio and getting IntelliSense, that was pretty revolutionary in mm -hmm. terms of you know what was the experience of programming. Right. Um, but then also, I think over, over time, I came to realize just how much the dev box setup Right. Is such an onerous process. And one of the I've things. I've got these big scripts to build up a machine, you know. Right. That's the way we used to do things. Right. And one of the things that Visual Studio has done so well for so long is actually set up your developer machine right. so that it has all of the dependencies that you need for the types of applications that you want to build. Yeah. Now, over the years, to your point around how it's all become more complex over time. The result of that is also that we we now have more of a constellation of tools that we need to install. We have other frameworks that are outside of the Microsoft ecosystem that we also need to, we have dependencies on. Mm -hmm. And so getting all of that configured is is challenging, but still is something that Visual it's Studio manageable. helps with. I also really appreciate, in the, in the past few years especially, not only have been iterating rapidly on Studio, we get previews all the time, but I'm not afraid to play with them. Like mm. Once upon a time, I used to have a machine for that purpose that I knew I could wreck and rebuild yeah. if the beta bits were problematic. But I have not run across a preview I could install, play with, remove, or ignore, and just continue working. For sure. I mean, in the early days, we actually didn't even have side-by-side -side installs yeah, of Visual Studio. Yeah. You, you couldn't do that. Yeah. Um, or, you know, the fact that the Windows SDK was tightly coupled yeah. to the version of Visual Studio. Um, so we've done a lot of work over the years to actually make it possible for you to be able to have side-by-side -side installs of Visual Studio that won't interfere with each other, that have isolated SDKs and things like that so that you can actually have multiple versions of SDKs. When you're a developer, things can go wrong from all different directions. Right. You know, environment I'm, variables, used to be registry keys. Like I'm trying to figure out, if I, am I fighting with the app or am I fighting with my environment? Right, right? exactly. That's, that's, that's always a challenge. Too. Right, right, right. Can we talk a bit about DevBox? I think that's an interesting address to that, too. Absolutely. So that's one of the things that I'm the most excited about with mm -hmm. DevBox is, you know, the fact that it actually makes it so much easier to set up your developer environment to the point that not only does it set up your developer environment, but mm -hmm. you can actually amortize that developer box setup. Get that configuration to, right. To the entire team. So right. if you actually have a sense of what, what projects you want to integrate with, you know what SDKs you need to mm -hmm. install, essentially it's basically becomes a VM image at that point, and then you can start to replicate that across everybody on your developer team. But even better than that, mm -hmm. not only do you get to have um, the developer environment that's optimized for the type of project that you're developing, but 
it's not that it's generalized. It's still personalized right. to your environment. The like, way you want to work. Like you have, once you have single sign-on mm -hmm. and you sign in to the IDE, then you also get the unified settings right. so that you have your settings be persisted. And then even further to the optimization of everybody on, on your team, you can then have pre-populated caches and things like that so that the load time can actually be much, much faster. So. As an example. Yeah, no, you know. that's very powerful. So people get what to work right away. Of course, but I immediately put my enterprise hat on. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what I really want? I mean, we've been talking about this on many of these uh, of these episodes, shifting left certain important things like mm -hmm. accessibility, mm -hmm. security. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I could use DevBox as the as the overall owner of that project to say, everybody's gonna work with these things turned on, configured this way, right. so that we get into that practice of introducing secure practice and accessible practice from the very beginning of the project rather than trying to retrofit it later on. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm very excited about is this idea of infrastructure as code, mm -hmm. but then using that as a way to kind of drive platform engineering across your entire engineering team. Yeah. One of the things that, that I do is I also run the team that works on the engineering systems inside of Microsoft that all developers at Microsoft use oh, wow. for, for to build in any So not product. just your own teams, but there's a lot of developers at Microsoft. That's, yes. 100,000? Yes, yes, like, yes. Those are big numbers. Yes, and so exactly. that's your group that yeah, we're responsible so for. Yeah, so part of the reason why we've been able to iterate on DevBox so quickly is because we've actually started using it. You guys are customers it. of it. Uh, I love yeah, that. and we we uh, we now have about 11,000, 12,000 developers internal to Microsoft that are using DevBox, you know, on a weekly basis. Wow. So it's really driving kind of the productivity across all of Microsoft. Well, I mean, going back to, you know, I'm the history guy, like <laughs> When Visual Studio adopted WPF for 2010, mm. WPF got dramatically better. Like right. the transformation in WPF 4 was profound because a group of very skilled developers really took it down its paces. So I feel the same way now about knowing that about DevBox. Those 10,000 people, they know where the team that built DevBox lives. Like, right. They and, will be on them to make and, it better. And we're just getting started. <laughs> sure, right? I mean, it's early right, days. We plan to roll it out to all of the developers at Microsoft. And we have, you know, folks in the Office team using it, mm -hmm. folks in the Azure team using it, uh, obviously folks in the Visual Studio team using it. So it's really a, a kind of a wide variety of That's, different types of applications. And it's always great when the, you're a consumer of your own product, that you yeah. get to have that experience. We had a great conversation with David Fowler about his experiences working on .NET 8 and even going back to like .NET 6 and how Studio depended on it as well. So mm -hmm. it was like, we got a version that the Studio depends on, but we're using Studio to build it. Like, there's mm -hmm. a lot of this lifting simultaneous problems that you must have to deal with. I think in terms of ecosystems right. all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I think about the challenges of, of you know, what's holding back developers in terms of them being more productive at the industry level or mm -hmm. at the Microsoft engineers level, I think about kind of all of these different systems that are interacting, right? Yeah. If you think about the the build time that yeah. it takes to have, that cycle. have an iteration, yeah. that represents a significant amount of your day. Yeah. And I mean, and, you know, and then multiply it by that many people. Like, exactly. Those are big numbers. Exactly, and it reminds me of the comic, you get a grabbing coffee because you're waiting for your code to compile, That's right. right? Just as an example, you know, we have folks inside Microsoft that work on the Chromium code base. Mm -hmm. It's an 11,000 project. 11,000 uh, project solution? Yes, yes, project solution. I gotta see this thing open. Like, that must be amazing <laughs> to see. But with DevBox, it's it's so much faster. Right. I think it's about eighty percent faster, if I remember right. Yeah. yeah, and that's a big, big project. Like it, impressive to see all of that. You know, you talked a little bit about IntelliSense and your first experiences with it. Today, I think we call it AI assistant. Well, this is the, the next yeah. kind of huge revolution. I mean, I do think that cloud hosting of developer environments is definitely one of the big things big, that's big happening push. right now. So yeah. DevBox, uh, GitHub Code Space is another example, different mm -hmm. approach. One of the things that's awesome about that is that you can scale as appropriate, get the right kind of you know level of, of CPU that you want to apply to mm -hmm. your project, but also you get pre-populated caches and other things like that that really accelerate the speed. Sure. But then the next dimension of this is bringing AI into your coding environment. We've made a lot of incredible progress over the last three, four years uh, working on first IntelliCode and then GitHub Copilot. Mm -hmm. 
bringing all of that into the Visual Studio family, Visual Studio itself. Now it's the case where we hear people talk about the fact that, you know, they write just a few characters of the line of code that might be a 70 character line of code and they get completion. But yeah. even further now it's, you know, you just input a natural language expression of the thing that you want the yeah. code to do. Yeah, your tent. And it and, manifests as code. And it actually manifests as code. And I think, you know, over time, we're going to continue to make it more and more intelligent as it starts to understand more about your code base. Yeah. And as the AI models get more sophisticated at, as well, it starts to become really more of an oracle that you can you can interact with mm -hmm. as though it was another developer on your team. It's, really, I like the name Copilot. I mean, yeah. because it, they are literally a co-pilot, they're helping you, but you are also the pilot. Like, mm -hmm. we're still driving, but go find this for me. The one I really liked was, explain this to me. Yeah, that one's Very so powerful. helpful. I mean, especially when you think about a junior developer mm -hmm. joining a team. The junior developer is often really intimidated yeah. by the fact that there's people with tons of experience on the team. I remember when I started, I, I, was, I was intimidated mm -hmm. to the point that you might not want to ask the yeah. question. But if you can ask the question of of an AI a that, bot, that yeah. has that context it's for you. It's pretty approachable. <laughs> yeah. You, you feel safe to ask any question. Yeah. You can start to learn about a code base much more rapidly. And then you can kind of save the the real questions, the real nuggets that the AI isn't able to answer right. for, for the senior developers on your team. Yeah. So you use their time more effectively and you're not blocked. You're moving right. forward. So right, right, right. you're keeping able to move on. This sort of the ecosystem that we're living in here, Visual Studio and many other products around it. I got to think about Visual Studio Code, certainly the GitHub suite and so forth. How do you talk about that overall? Like what's the view of all of these products and how they work together? The way that I think about it is that, you know, we have the developer workload mm -hmm. side of what we work on, which is everything that you use in the course of doing dev or test for the solutions that you're building. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I need to make sure that all of these products integrate super, super well. To your point around shifting left, yes. one of the things that we think about a lot is how can we reduce the amount of context switching that's required for a developer to be able to address a security bug, as sure. an example. And so we really want to make sure that that all of that information is brought back into your developer environment. That IDE space. Exactly. So you're always in the same context. In in a way that is intuitive and approachable and natural to the way that you've always used your mm -hmm. IDE. Um, so if that's, you know, squiggles or suggestions or... Star on the side. You know, yeah, yeah, there's lots or, of interesting or, cues. you know, the, the list of tasks that you need to work on. Yeah. You know, we really want all of that to kind of be shifted left so that developers first of all, don't have to sh change context to address these kinds of issues, but also when it comes to a security vulnerability or something that could be a security vulnerability mm -hmm. down the road, we really want the developer to address it. Right. Because I do not want that to be checked in to the persistence of our source code repositories right. because it basically represents a potential attack vector. Absolutely. Right. So I actually want to make it um, as simple as possible to ensure that every developer is responding to all of these alerts, all of these issues right. as early as possible in the process of Preferably writing. before they've even checked it in, well, you know, in the not perfect a, world. Not even preferably before <laughs> they've checked it in, even further before they've even written a line of code. Right. Because if we can actually get the AI assistant to also have the context yeah. of what is a security vulnerability, right. Or you know that there's a, a vulnerability in a an open source package or something like that that you want it to use the more most recent version. Then that means that they never wrote that line of code. They never that got there in the, first place. in the first place. Yeah, that's really great. And I just think you think about the amount of context you need around that. It's like how is this application being used? What exposures does it have? What dependencies does it have? That whole bill of materials. It's actually a lot of work to try and keep that in your mind. If the tools could take that load off of us to say, I've already looked at all of this and you get the green check, yeah. that's a good day. Or well, you get the red check and I point you, here's what you should look at. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the other dimension of, of how both it's become more complex over time, but also an opportunity for us as the tools maker mm -hmm. to make it easier for developers. You know, if you think about when we built applications 20 years ago, a lot of them were client server applications. Yeah two-tiered applications, yep. maybe three-tiered applications. It wasn't as complex in terms of the variety of different dependencies that you had on managed cloud services. Yep. 
and, and that array of clients now that everyone and, expects. And you know, you iOS and Android and Windows and you know, a, you a browser it. like yeah. all of those things. You have to build for all of them. So the combinatorics of of yeah. building a modern application is is pretty challenging. But even further, if you think about the complexity of setting up your developer environment. Yeah. To be able to do all of those things, to right. be able to address it, and then and then the result is that you end up with you know junior developers joining your team. It takes them weeks yeah. to actually set up their dev test environment. So, what could we be doing to actually make it easier to not only set up their local dev box and and kind of the dev box that they work on on a day to day basis, even if that's hosted in the cloud, but also their dev test environment for the application that they're going to be iterating right. on. And so we've really been trying to work on this notion of like dev boxes are hosted in a dev center, mm -hmm. and the dev center could also have other cloud resources oh, right. that represent the you know application uh, that things they're going to depend upon. Yeah. That's another whole other dev cycle. Like how can we shorten the onboarding? Yeah. Get someone productive in the least amount of time possible. Yeah, and it's not just onboarding though, mm -hmm. because you know. Additionally, if you're working on a particular feature or you're addressing a bug in a certain version right. of the code, you oftentimes need to set up yet another developer yep. environment that represents that feature branch or represents, you know, the the version that was shipped to production months ago. Yeah, it's a great. <laughs> it's also a great idea of just the, the the thought of hey, I need a dev environment for that build from X many months ago with this correct configuration ready to go. Go right. make it for me, and now I can you know try and understand it and find this issue for this customer. Right, and I think I think that's the other change that's been happening over the last couple of years as we think about like what does it really mean to be a cloud native developer building mm -hmm. cloud native solutions, right. right? A lot of times what that really means is that you have containers as the common kind of medium right. that represents the application environment. Yeah. And, and it also represents the developer environment. Yeah, because it, work, it works the same way. And some stuff can be running on the machine while they're doing the development. Some of that stuff's going to be pushed into the cloud or elsewhere. You, right. know, you have that flexibility once you're in that form factor. Right, right. It's powerful stuff, and it just speaks to the complexity is not diminishing. We're getting more options, not fewer options. But I think that that's also something that Visual Studio really helps with. Mm -hmm. So as an example, just thinking about containerized application environments, yeah. right? Just a couple of years ago, you had to go understand the depths of Docker files and mm -hmm. how to actually build container images. And we've really made it pretty easy in Visual Studio to basically, you know, take your source code, build a container image right. without having to, to understand you all of You don't have to the, write all that YAML. Yeah, it's going to generate exactly. a lot for you. Exactly. And, yeah. and it basically feels much more like that kind of cockpit environment, that operating system for a developer yeah. in some senses that, that gives you the you know, user interfaces that makes that a lot easier to It to just kind of sends that manifest. I know what this code does. These are the things it's going to need. You can make it the minimum container that will run that well. Right, and right, And right. be ready to deploy it, try it in different environments. Right. It's exciting times. Still, more things coming. Like, we've been making this product for a long time. Still depend on it. And there's obviously more things coming as we address a evolving developer landscape. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, ignoring AI, ignoring mm -hmm. cloud hosting, we could spend all of our time just improving the performance sure. of yeah. the developer in our loop, which we spend a lot of time doing, yes. and and that would you know continue to to delight our user base, yeah. right? That that would they would love that. Well, all the more ways that the tools help me be more productive to get working on that clever stuff that I'm thinking of to get it down, and the rest is taken care of by the tooling. You know, that's what productivity looks like. Yeah, DevBox setup. The solution load time. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to create a new project that's compliant to your environment? How long does it take to iterate on a cycle? Making it, make those and changes, get them tested. What does get it look deployed. like to actually deploy it yeah. uh, and to to test it? All of those things. Uh, we just continually look at it from the perspective of where does the developer have to spend energy, yeah. and how can we actually reduce the amount of energy that the the developer has to spend so that we can do more automation more intuitive defaults right. and just better user experience. Let them focus on the value they can provide. Exactly. So we're only a few months away from .NET 8. And, uh, obviously, I had, you know, Studio plays a huge part in that. What mm -hmm. are you looking forward to? It's got to have an impact on Studio. Yeah, well, I mean, I think when we started thinking about .NET 8 and what was really the priority for it, we were really thinking about what do we need to do to make .NET and you know, Visual Studio a better environment mm -hmm. for writing cloud-native applications. Right. A lot of developers today are not writing 
greenfield applications. No. They're dealing with a lot of existing legacy code. Yeah. And so one of the th areas that we've been really focusing on is an upgrade assistant so that you can actually scan your code to understand what you need to do with your existing code to get it to be ready to be deployed to the cloud. Okay. Um, and so it, it actually will do the scanning in the context of, of Visual Studio. It will surface all the kinds of issues that you this might need to work easily, through. This will move easily. This needs some changes. So it's yeah. an advisor. Yeah, exactly. And and you know I think we we have aspirations that over time the AI assistant will actually also be able to help you understand how to take the steps to remediate any of the issues that come up in the upgrade assistant. Because often when I'm thinking about an assistant like that, I would probably pop to a search engine at that point and say, what does this mean? So right. it would be but great it, if that was all integrated. Again, this comes back to the importance of, of having the developer have all of the context yeah. when they need it, where they need it, so they don't need to pop out to an external browser or some other window and really lose context and lose focus. Right, and plus, it, now you get the challenge of writing that whole search. There's so much information when you're in that context yeah. that would help with understanding that better. Right, right, You'd right. probably save a lot of time exactly. doing it that way. But even further, as we think about how applications evolve mm -hmm. to become cloud-ready, a lot of them, really, it starts with API extensibility, right. API right. endpoints, um, or when they're thinking about how to architect new cloud native applications, a lot of times it's really about microservices and exposing API endpoints uh, to create modularity across your application estate. And even beyond your application or other other apps in your organization, you might be exposing those APIs publicly, where that's a service that other people could use. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot of businesses that I would say are are API first businesses yeah. in some senses. But so we've been really trying to think about how can we make the developer environment more of an API first developer mm -hmm. environment. You know, we did a lot of work in the last version of .NET to to support minimal API so that you know it's easier to just write write an API uh, with less syntax, yeah. but also in a way that is Open API spec compliant. Uh, That's what being a good cloud native is all about, right? Exactly, right. Uh, but then further, like, how do you actually iterate on that? How right. can you? The look first version is easy one. Yes. Subsequent versions. Yeah, and, and how can you test it? How yeah. can you look at the HTTP endpoints and, and test it with different kinds of inputs uh, and see what those results are? But then also, how do we explore and find the other API endpoints that are available in your environment? Is there an endpoint explorer? Exactly. Okay. So, so we've been integrating the endpoint explorer in the context of Visual Studio as well. Um, so that you really can explore all of the APIs that your organization uses in the context of, of Visual Studio. It sounds like one of those things of before you build it, we may already have it. Yes, and, and I think I'm seeing a lot of organizations become more and more concerned with efficiency. Right. But one of the ways that they, they think about how do I deliver efficiently is to have more inner source, more yeah. sharing across the organizations or across you know different applications that they're trying to build, so that they don't need to reinvent the real and, yeah. and just end know up what's with... already out there. As, as I'm starting to lay out this new project, you go, oh, I can take one of those and one of those and one of those, and I'm I've got a big piece of work done here already, and I'm adding to the knowledge base that already exists within the organization rather than making right. another one. Right. Exactly. That's yeah, powerful stuff and, and, and a great combination of things. Again, it seems like the perfect role for an IDE, like you're sitting in a place where all of those pieces come together. Right, exactly. Any other parts we've missed? What haven't we talked about today? I think another dimension of cloud native is really the, the act of deployment. Right. And you know, a lot of people, when they think about what does it mean to be a cloud native application, a lot of it really starts with having containers mm -hmm. be at the center of, of how your operations and management uh, works, right? right? So, so your, your delivery is not necessarily source code, but rather it's a container that has the application that right. is then that deployed. That manifests all that information, how to put it out there, how it scales. Like, right. It's a lot of information. But it's also a lot of complexity, mm. right? Containers as a as a topic, it's a deep, deep topic. And, and you know, you could become an expert in container technology. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of developers have to meet the requirements of their operations teams to deliver in the context of containers, but don't necessarily want to become an expert in container technology. That's fair. One of the things we've been working on in Visual Studio is how can you actually make sure that the the resulting artifact for your application is a container, right? But you don't necessarily have to get into the depths of of YAML and and building. How much containers. YAML do I need to write here? 
again, the environment knows an awful lot about that. Like you can probably draw most of the manifest from the code. Right, right. And even further, not only how do we build the container itself, mm -hmm. but also how do we build the CI CD pipeline so that I can not only build the solution, but also run my tests yeah. and then actually deploy it to the target environment. Right, put it out into that repository where it can be picked up and deployed into whatever environment needs to go. Like that's a great pipeline to set up and the idea that that's just part of your building process. Right. That once you're happy with the code and it's tested in your space enough, you can go, all right, check it in and the system will pick it up. Yeah, exactly. It's powerful. I mean, the landscape keeps getting bigger and you keep coming up with tools to help us <laughs> support it. I'm appreciative. It's kind of easy when you have such an enthusiastic user base. It's awesome to have the, the user base that we have, but they're so engaged. Yeah. One of the reasons why I love working for developers as my customers, and I've done so for 22 years now, mm -hmm. is because you know they're tech enthusiasts, yeah. right? They, they love giving feedback yeah. <laughs> on the technology that they use. And so the result is we have just fantastic feedback systems from our user base that, that really drives a lot of a lot of the innovation in terms of like trying to solve problems that they're faced with, but also just fantastic suggestions that we just incorporate directly into the yeah. next version. You can of the see project. that all that feedback shows up in your work too. It's a, sometimes you get stunned by a conversation like that shows up in a preview just not that much long later. Yeah, I mean, I live for fast feedback cycles, mm -hmm. right? And to me, a fast feedback cycle is not just when the customer gives us you know, the suggestion or right. the, the issue that they're encountering, but how long does it take for us to implement a solution to what they've asked for right. and to deliver it to them? So Push it in a preview, watch that feedback now that we tinker with it, and then it shows up in a version. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I love working on on behalf of developers as right. customers, because they, they're early adopters, so you end up with that fast feedback cycle all the time. Even having the developer customers inside of Microsoft right. that use Visual Studio, you know, we have huge numbers of developers inside of, of Microsoft that use VS. That's also part of what drives, you know, the rapid iteration and... and Absolutely, both a customer and a, a consumer of the product and a creator of the product, so it works together. Yeah. Tool builders, tool consumers. Yeah. I mean, it's so much fun to talk to you. It's been a really great series, and it's fun to wrap up with you with just the ideas that with, there's only more to come in this space, and we could keep going faster. Yeah. Hope this was fun for you. Thanks so much for watching this mini series. I'm Richard Campbell. Hope to talk to you again.